Go ahead. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Pool and Around show, uh, where we interview pool players, legends in the game of pool, pool room owners, um, and we're just pool nuts. So we want you to like, subscribe, and share and share our channel so we can keep providing you this content. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure today to introduce a man named Jay Helfert. He's a legend in the game of pool. He's an author, a world traveler, uh, promoter, tournament director. Um, he's really okay. funny. You've, probably, you've definitely heard his voice if you've watched Pro Pool on the commentary. Pro um, player. My, my fiance uh, knows your voice, Jay, because she falls asleep and I'm watching pool videos. So she knows exactly what you sound like. She doesn't know who you are, but she knows your voice. A lot, a lot of people recognize me. It's funny, Sean. I meet people sometimes in the Philippines and we're talking and they don't. But when I start to talk, they say, oh, I know who you are. You're Jay Helfer. They recognize me more by my voice than by seeing me. Because a lot of the shows I do, I'm only you only see me for minutes, for moments. I mean, you know. Yeah. So, well, it's a it's a very, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, if there was a Hall of Fame for contribution to pool alone, you'd be in it. Um, and we're very well, happy to you. have you. With that being said, I want uh, as you know, me and Chris are partners in this. Chris does most of the work, honestly. Uh, he just he keeps booking these interviews. So please, please, please share this interview. Uh, with everyone you know that loves pool. All right, so we'll get into we'll get into the interview part, and just just start off as, as what what got you into pool? Probably more than anything else, watching the movie The Hustler. It came out in like 1961. I was 17 years old. Where, did you go to the theater to see it? Oh yeah, it was. That was actually a hit movie in the movie theaters. Yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't go right away because I was a tennis player when I was in high school. But something prompted me to go. And I just I was fascinated with the with the the whole theme of the movie and uh, and the uh, Fast Eddie character played by Paul Newman. I, I wanted that to be me. Okay, now Chris usually asks this question, so I'm going to let him ask the question that he's been asking a lot of our guests, because I'm, I'm glad the color of money came up, or the hustler came up. Okay, so today, if they were to redo redo the color of money, you know, like, like they redo all these movies. So, in your opinion, who would play the best Fast Eddie part, and who would play the best uh, Vincent or Tom Cruise part right now? Wow, that's a good one. Um, wow, for Fast Eddie, there's some actors I really like, relatively young guys like Ed Norton. Um, what about pool players that would play the part? Oh, pool players would play the part. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of young guns. I would like to see somebody like Josh Roberts. He's a little different, but that's, that's okay. You know, um, I like him. Uh, it would, it would, in my opinion, it would have to be an American player. I don't know. I don't know if uh, Skyler could do that, but maybe he could. Skyler Woodward. We got, uh, we got that. We, um, we asked Paul Pottier the same thing. And uh, I'd have to, I'd have to think. I think probably the right person is maybe not right now the top the top young player but there are some exciting young players in pool they got some good personalities we know that um the fast city part was a was a seasoned guy a older veteran guy yeah and oh that was in color of money yeah, yeah. so um somebody said kim davenport would make a good part for the for fast eddie yeah uh, i think so but i was thinking, i could be fast eddie yeah <laughs> that's, what I was, that's what I was leading to. Um, you I just thought have, about it. You have said, to I can play consultant. that part. You can um, be a consultant on the show uh, yeah. and play the part. Uh, Billy and Cardona. He's a he's a he's an old wise man in the pool world. So a seasoned veteran. Billy was quite the quite the money player when he was a young man. I've heard. Yeah. Um, what about Mike Siegel? Mm. He, I mean, because he's. Maybe 
He's entertaining. Actually, a lot. Mike Siegel did not do a lot of commentary for pool, but he was very good when he did it. Yeah, Mike would probably be good. A lot of people don't know that Mike was the uh, uh, the main technical advisor for Paul Newman during the making of The Hustler. I mean, the making of The Color of Money. Excuse me. So he, he set up all the shots, you mean? or he, Yeah, he's... He set him up and he shot every pretty much every trick shot he shot. Not for Tom Cruise, though. Yeah, he he coached Tom, excuse me, Mike Siegel coached Tom Cruise more than Paul Newman was a was another entire entity entirely. But Mike Siegel spent a lot of time with Tom Cruise during the actual production of the movie. And he said Tom Cruise picked up pool pretty quickly. He said within six months. He was a he was a high level amateur player. So Tom Cruise did most of his shots. There were one or two, um, maybe more extraordinary shots, and Siegel shot those. Okay. Hey Chris, I got a random one on your Facebook post. Uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before. You said, "I wonder who the best NBA or NFL." Player, cool player, is, right. cool player is. If that makes sense, Jay, you, uh, you know a lot of famous people. Can you? Can you? Uh... Yeah. Well, the the best celebrity pool players that I know of is Joe Rogan. Okay. He's a good. He's a. He's like a shortstop. He can play. And then, Rax, you know, um, not you know, not like a pro, but he can play. Joe Rogan's a good player. Mark Kendall. The uh, lead guitarist for Great White, that famous band, right. he's a, he's an even better player, Mark Kandel. Um, among athletes, there's a couple golfers that are good that are good pool players. Uh, two or three golfers that I know. Of. Fred Couples played good, fairly good pool. Um, who was the other guy? I'm trying to think of. Uh, but there were there were two or three golfers. Um, for some reason, a lot of golfers gravitated toward playing pool as a hobby. And, you know, they had the right attributes to be a pool player. Uh, some of the skills are similar. Um, but I played pool with a lot of football players, a lot of basketball players, uh, like Laker players and stuff like that. And they all looked like amateurs. Probably the best of the bunch that ever came through my pool room was Derek Fisher the guard for the Lakers, yeah. he could play a little bit. <clears throat> and surprisingly, the owner of the Lakers years ago, Jerry Buss, was a decent player. I know that okay. uh, they done some kind of a charity a charity fundraiser a few years back in, in Denver. And uh, Alonzo Mourning, you know, played center for the Heat. They said, yeah. he, said, he, said he played real well. Oh, well, I, don't, I never saw him play. But I saw several NBA players, Paul Pierce and – um, a few of the Celtics players play. And you know what? They all look like amateurs. Well, Jay, will you move your uh, camera back? We've only got the top of your face. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry good. about that. You're good. So you played tennis. In high school, I was a good tennis player. And then what? As soon as you were introduced to pool, you just dropped the tennis? It kind of happened that way. Maybe I should have stuck with tennis. I don't know. I I had an opportunity. I went to Oklahoma University, and I had an opportunity to be on the freshman team because I was I not I would have been a walk on, but the coach welcomed me because he saw I had a good record. I I only lost one match my senior year in high school, um, and that was for the city championship. So our team was the runner up to the city championship. Uh, that was in Dayton, Ohio, but. I watched that movie that summer before I went to Oklahoma years, my freshman year, and I just quit playing tennis. I was hanging out in the union building every day where they had like 25 pool tables. I was in there every day cutting classes and playing pool. I was just focused, um, obsessed is probably the right word, on learning how to play this game because it was for me, I was a jock when I was a kid. I played tennis, I played golf, I played basketball, I played baseball. And I was pretty good at all of them, even though I was a small man. I was good enough to make the teams, let's say that. But pool was by far the hardest game I ever tried to play. Much more, more difficult even than golf. Because in golf, in one summer, 
I was hitting the ball pretty good. I could shoot like four, 39 or 40 for nine holes. But pool, it took me a year just to learn how to make balls. I mean, a year of obsession just to get to where I could make shots comfortably. And then maybe another year of obsession where I started to learn how to control the cue ball. Uh, my, um, my learning curve was three years of total obsession. I mean, I'm talking playing 8, 10, 12 hours every day, six, seven days a week. If I took a day off, it was because I was sick or something. Um, but I mean, I was, I was obsessed with learning how to play the game. Now, by the time I was 21, I was finally good enough to where I could beat a few people. The guys who had been beating me all along, now I was beating them. How long did you stay in took. Oklahoma? Pardon me? How long did you stay in Oklahoma? Uh, close to three years, two and a half to three years. Because that's where we're from. That's where we're at right now. Whereabouts in Oklahoma? Well, I live in Lawton, and he lives in Oklahoma City. So he did. Well, I played all over Oklahoma City back in the 1960s. I played in Lawton, Oklahoma. Back then, there were a lot of bars, and there was a lot of action in the bars. But I played everywhere. Uh, Stillwater, Guthrie, uh, uh, even little towns, Sepulpa. They had pool rooms everywhere. But, and, and where Oklahoma was, in, in the town of Norman, there were a couple of pool rooms. There was a pool room on the campus of OU called Campus Corner. And that's where all the, the college guys went to play. Yeah, it's called Coaches now. Okay. And they've got all they got all Gandhi tables in there. Yeah. Um, Listen, Oklahoma City in the 60s had – probably two dozen pool rooms and a hundred bars. Yeah. Wow. And the best player back then was a guy named Norman Hitchcock. I was just I don't know if you, to ask you about him. I knew, I knew him. him. We gambled with him a couple times. He was too – He Norman Hitchcock didn't travel much. He stayed pretty much in Oklahoma, but he beat all the roadmen that came through. Nobody could beat him. That's what we heard. That's what we heard. I want to I want to do a story on him. And I'm trying to find some pictures and you know get somebody to to tell us some stories about him and put something together just to you know just want to be part of the show but just to just for the history of the game. Chris, yeah. it's difficult because in those days, remember, a guy like Hitchcock, he's a money player. He didn't want his picture taken. He didn't want his picture anywhere. Now, the top players knew who he was. But a, lot, but a lot of other guys that were trying to travel around and play pool, they didn't know Norman Hitchcock. And if they came to Oklahoma City, they found out all about him. They said he, he quit for about 12 years. I like guess what was told last night. And then when he when he, when he he came back, said he was he was playing stronger than ever in his, yeah. in his 50s. Um, yeah. I got so something interesting to say about him. When I first started playing, it was a place called Jamaica Joe's, and he was – at the end of uh, end of his career, but he was still playing every day on a nine foot yeah. in the corner, and I I could have went over there and asked him to play or learn from him, and I didn't. He was just this old man who kept to himself, and he played one guy named Harvey Harvey uh, every day in there, and I didn't even really watch him either. I, I feel ashamed almost. That's a when was that? Like twenty years ago. Yep. yep. When I'm, did Norman I'm, die? 2006. 2000. So he must have been 70, in his 70s then. Yeah, I was in high school. I graduated in 04. So, uh, yeah, I'm a high schooler kid, and he's right there next to me. And I never asked him a thing about pool, not once. Because he's a few years older than me. He was probably 10 years older than me. Okay. And I'm in my late 70s now. And, then, so, and when I first run into Hitchcock, I was like 19 or 20. So he was, yeah. So in 76, yeah, he would have been probably in his early to mid-70s, something like that. Yeah, he uh, back then, at the time when he started, when Sean started playing, James Walden was the guy in Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. He was a legend, too. I Now, James is probably only like 50 years old now. But he was a top money player. And he, and the bigger the bet, the more he liked it. Mm -hmm. um, and he he took it off pretty good, too. His reputation was a winner, you know. 
Yeah, I watched him play tag line. That's the only that's the only money big money match that I ever watched him play. But he he beat tag line two two headsets for five thousand each. And pa- pa- Alex's backer said, "I'm done." So we yeah. can't beat this guy. So they they, they had trouble beating James Walden. He. You, you didn't. You rarely heard about him let, betting less than a thousand a game or five or ten thousand a set. I w- I got involved with him. Um, I was in with uh, Jack Cooney. They played a hundred thousand dollar match about fifteen years ago at Derby City, when it was at the old location, Executive West. They played, for, put up fifty thousand each, and James gave Jack Cooney, I think, uh, ten eight nine eight playing one pocket and they played 10 ahead and it lasted three or four days. Wow. James lost that one. But listen, very few, Jack Cooney is another legend. You know, he was, James was cut from the same mold as Jack Cooney. They played the, the biggest games and they were both winners. So I guess they finally had to clash. And when, when James played Jack, Jack was about a 60-year-old man. And James was probably in his early 40s. But uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great, probably the best one-pocket match I ever saw. I watched hours of it every day. I had, had $5,000 of, of Jack's action. So okay. I, had a, I had a sweating interest. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. I, I want to, uh, Chris, I know you have some questions. I haven't seen those questions you have, so I'm just going to ask uh, random stuff. I want to know, I definitely want to know about the Philippines. Uh, I hear you talk about the Philippines a lot, so maybe maybe not repeat the same stuff that I've already heard, but where? Well, the Philippines, I'll tell you some, some things that we don't talk about in the pool world. The people there... It, I tend to be cynical because I come from the pool world and the gambling world, and I'm a little bit wary of people. And it took me a while to realize the 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 ambiance and the friendliness of the people there is real. They are genuinely outgoing and friendly to foreigners, and they especially like Americans. We're we're there among the foreigners. They like us the best. If you go there. They will not call you Sean. They will call you Sir Sean and Sir Chris. That's the respect you will get. I promise you. It's automatic. And um, when you go into the malls and you go into the stores, it's not like a a mall in America where you've got to find somebody to take care of you or direct you to where you want to find what you're looking for. You go into a big store there and there'll be a dozen young people in every area all dressed in nice uniforms and all smiling, laughing, having a good time and ready and willing to help you and show you where anything is. And it's just a, there's an atmosphere there in the the stores that I never see anywhere in the United States. They have fun. They're all having fun working. You know, they're all laughing and joking and kidding. And it took me a while to get into that because I thought, hey, wait a second, they're supposed to be working here. But (laughs) they are. They are. But they have a good time. And it's kind of contagious. Pretty after a while, you start laughing along with them. Playful. Very playful. Yeah. And anybody there that's a high school graduate is is conversant in English because they study English from probably the fourth grade on. So English is their second language which makes it appealing for people like me, for foreigners like me. I'm not, I don't speak any other languages. I don't speak Spanish. I don't speak French. I don't speak Tagalog, even though I've been to the Philippines 50 times. I, I, I mean, I understand some words. I can read a menu and stuff like that, but I can't carry on a conversation. So but the good thing is I don't have to. Huh? Oh yeah. Cause they're speaking English or there's someone nearby that can translate. Yeah, yeah. There, well, yeah. <coughs> but that's it. You go into any hotel or any restaurant, you can you can converse in English. It's not a problem. And even all these kids, these young kids that you see working in department stores and stuff like that, most of them are college graduates to get that job. And they right. speak fluent English. So they know that to serve their customer base, they must speak English. 
because there's so many foreigners stop shopping in their stores. Now, about the pool world, it's, to me, it's the center of the pool universe. That's it. Um, Especially now with what Sharks is doing. Yeah, exactly. But it's been that way for a long, long time. Really, Efren and, and uh, Jose Perica and Francisco Bustamante, when they started winning all that money in tournaments in the United States and overseas, it really, it was already a big sport. But in the Philippines, if you're a pool star, if you're a star in the pool world, like Chua and Aranas, they just won the World Cup of Pool. They're sports stars. They're as well known in the Philippines as a LeBron James is in this country. They're that well. There's they're rec I'll tell you one quick story. I don't think I've ever told this one uh, online anywhere. Um, I was staying in a hotel called the Bayshore Hotel um, in in uh, in Pasay City. Okay, and I talked to Efren. And Efren decided he wanted to come and, and meet me and take me to lunch. So we made it a time. And in the Philippines, everything runs late. It's like Mexico. Everybody's, everybody, everything could be manana. So we made a time to meet like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I go out to the front of the hotel where the valet parking is. And I'm waiting for Efren. And there's a lot of people. Go it's a big, beautiful, nice hotel. A lot of people going in and out. And the, all the Filipinos working there, parking cars and stuff like that. And I'm sitting on the curb waiting. And I wait and wait and wait. Finally, close to 2.30, here comes this large SUV, full-size SUV. Because Efren has a driver, right? This is like 15 or 20, good 15 years ago. And the SUV pulls up and parks right in a valet spot. And uh, I'm waiting. I don't know who's getting out of that. It could just be a rich Filipino. And Efren gets out of the car, along with two or three other people with him. And people begin to notice that it's Efren Reyes. And Efren sees me and waves to me, and I wave to him. He comes walking over to where I'm now standing up to greet me. And we stand there and, and chat together for maybe five minutes and there has to be a hundred people in a crowd that gather all around us. And they, they're they completely, um, um, uh, uh, they give us our privacy. You know what I mean? They are intrigued. Nobody comes up and asks them for his autograph. Nobody comes in. They're all probably 10, 15, 20 feet away. They're all just jump. Kids are jumping and looking and pointing. That's Bata, that's Bata. I can hear him say, look, Bata, Bata's here, Bata's here. And Efren, he's oblivious. He knows they're there, but he's used to it. He's yeah. such a celebrity. And finally, when we're done talking, he turns around, he doesn't sign any gross, but he turns around and waves and says hi to the people. And they're excited. They're excited. And then he walks inside with me and we go into the restaurant. But I never forgot that, that, a crowd gathered just because Efren was standing there. And uh, that, so that really gave me an idea of how big a celebrity he was in the Philippines. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't really, I didn't realize it until that moment. I knew he was well boned, but, I, but it's like everybody knows who he is to this day. <coughs> Let me get some water real quick. Go ahead, go ahead. Need to find out how to get an interview with Efren. Right? With, yeah. with Drew J. <laughs> no doubt. He's like he's like the Filipino Elvis. Yeah, he's like the Filipino liaison. Yeah. He's like no, a, Efren is the Filipino Elvis. Oh yeah. All right, I'm okay now. Is it Manny Pacquiao plays pool real good too? Man oh yeah, you know what? Manny plays good. Manny plays good. Probably almost as good as Joe Rogan. Oh, when Manny puts on a tournament, he always plays in them. And I've seen him win matches. You know? Joe Rogan versus Manny Pacquiao. Now, that would be a good one. That would be close. Believe me. <laughs> well, I'm betting on whatever side. It would be close. I'm betting my money with you, Jay. I feel okay, like you. Well, <laughs> book that one and you got a, you got a winner. You put that one online and you'll have a million people watching it, I guarantee you. You know? Uh, so how, he, how, can we, how can we get an interview with Efren? With Efren? Yeah. Uh, I'm writing it down. <laughs> I probably get somewhere. Hang on a second. 
Oh, I got to get my Philippine phone. I have a phone number for him. It's a it's a Philippine number. Um, I could probably reach him, you know, but it's if you want me to try to find a way to get a hold of him for you, I will. Even I mean, like I said, even if it's if it's like this, you know, and he's got his. I mean, I know he speaks some English, but yeah, um, he's got his translator there. He, he speaks better English than you think. Believe me. He understands English quite well. Mm -hmm. And he's a little bit shy about speaking it. Many Filipinos that speak English are shy because they know that they're not as fluent as we are. Which, yeah, which, I understand that. I can understand that. Um, so they're careful. They're, they're careful with what they say. There's, listen, Efren has an agent, Rolando Vicente. V-I-C-E-N-T-E, -E, Rolando. And you can probably find him on Facebook. And if you tell him I gave you his name, he might be able to get effort on. Because, listen, even when I'm in, we, my home in the Philippines is in the same city, Angela City, where Efren lives. And I have his phone number. And there has been times I texted him and I get no return call. He, you know, I don't think he uses his phone that much. But I know a pool room there where he hangs out. So if I ever want to see him, he goes to the pool room almost every day in Angeles City when he's home and plays chess. So what is the <laughs> uh, what's the time difference there? Well, I mean we're two hours. Uh, it's uh, from from uh, the way I people say it different ways, but uh, from the West Coast, it's nine hours earlier. Like right now, what time is it right now? So it's uh, four thirty. Yeah. So there. It's 7.30 in the morning, but it's tomorrow. We're on Thursday. They're on Friday time. So uh, it's 7.30 a.m. there right now. Right. Okay. okay. What, time do you, what time do you think Efren wakes up? <laughs> I have no idea. He's a pool player. I have no so. idea. The Filipinos, you know, it's a tropical climate. And everybody in the Filipinos tend to work in the morning rest or sleep in the afternoon and everybody comes out at night because it cools down at night kind of like in mexico that you know see at siesta time in the daytime and once the sun goes down like six seven o'clock at night the streets are crowded the restaurants are full and everything keeps hopping they stay out their bars do not close at two in the morning you could, the bars will be hopping till four and five in the morning. Wow. They'll be going. I've gone out with Francisco Bustamante a couple times, and at midnight, things are just getting started. In fact, if you go to the clubs and bars, people really start wow. showing up like at 10 o'clock at night, and they stay till three and four in the morning. So well, they're on a little bit of a different place. schedule. It is. It is. Well, pool rooms, yeah. too. Pool rooms will stay open as long as there's action. Uh, are the pool rooms doing well there? Are they? Well, yeah, they are. They're they're having a resurgence. When I first started going to the Philippines 20 years ago, there were little neighborhood pool rooms on every corner with two and three two and three tables. And you're talking to a guy who probably played in more of those little neighborhood pool rooms than anybody. Because Sean, I loved it. I loved it because it reminded me of pool in the USA in the 1960s, where every town had a pool room or two. And in the Philippines, it was that way where there was pool. You go walk down any block, down any alley, and there'd be a little pool room. And what I like best, again, like the US in the 1960s, is if I walked in a pool room, right away, people would say, you want to play. You want to play. And they want to play for money. But the money game was rotation which I had never really played, but I learned their style of rotation. And typically the games you get in the little pool rooms, you're playing rotation for a hundred pesos, 200, you know, two, three, four, five, a, a really big game with a local player like that is like a thousand, like $20 a game. That was a big game there. And I had a few guys that own pool rooms that, I'm going back 15 to 20 years ago when I was still playing a lot. And I'd play them a 1,000 pesos a game. And it was fun because there'd be a huge crowd watching us play. And they would be betting on the match. 
people would bet on me too because they, you know, they saw, they saw what I enjoy is that if I made a good, it wasn't like they were all rooting against me because I was a foreigner. If I made a good shot or a good run out, they cheered for me. And I liked that. That made me feel good. So they will acknowledge your skill if you can play. So, but what I really liked is any time I ever walked in a little pool room, a Filipino always asked me to play right away. They wanted to play. And I said, I after I started playing rotation a little bit and got the feel of the game, um, I'd say, yeah, I'll play you your game. Because they would play nine ball or ten ball or eight ball. I'd say, I'll play your rotation. And they liked that. So I, I probably played pool with at least a couple hundred different guys in the Philippines. And they're not all top players. There's a lot of guys that play like shortstop speed and below and below. But they all gamble. I I played guys that played my speed, and I I, I played I but I played guys that were. Now I've come to find out who they were. I ran into hustlers when I went into pool rooms and beat a couple of people. They would bring somebody in that I couldn't beat. Even typically, that back in those days when I was playing a lot of pool between ten and twenty years ago, um, if I got them to play me one pocket, they had no chance. Because they didn't, even if they could kill me in nine ball, they had no concept of the game of one pocket. And a lot of times I'd have to show them the game. I said, it's really simple. You put up 15 balls, the one who makes eight balls in their corner pocket wins the game. And they liked it. This is so simple. But they didn't know. They had no idea what to do. They would roll up against the pack. You know what I mean? And that, that won't win the game. But every once in a while, they'd bring a Filipino in there who didn't know how to play one pocket, but it didn't matter. They bank balls off the end rail, cut balls in from the, I said, who the heck is this guy? Now I found out it's I was playing Roland Garcia and Carlo Beato and people like that. You know, they became well known later. So hey, besides the Joe Rogan Manny Pacquiao match, what I think would be a good event is one pocket, Philippines versus USA. Yeah. I think USA might have a chance. Nine ball, no way. No. But one yeah, I like, I, I, yeah, that that's that's yeah, that's a good match. And what's happened in the last ten years is the top Philip. It really began with Dennis, because when Dennis first came over here fifteen years ago, he was not a good one pocket player. No, I should say it began with Efren, because you know Efren. Once he learned to play one pocket thirty years ago, he dominated. But a lot of the guys that were coming here to play tournaments focused on nine ball. But Dennis really focused. He saw that if he wanted to win big money gambling, he needed to play one pocket. And, man, once he learned how, that was it. So now all the Filipinos, a lot of these guys, like Carlo even, and, and Warren Kiemko and um, Santos and those guys, they used to come to my house in L.A. 10 and 12 years ago, and they played one pocket with me because even though I was no longer a, a strong player, I knew the moves. And I could show them the moves and show them what to do in a lot of spots, how to keep put, put them on the end rail, make them shoot straight in off the end rail, see how they like that, you know, and how you how you uh, uh, play safe and stuck, put the cue ball against the pack and move ball. I showed them you didn't have to make bank shots. All you had to do was leave them close to your hole and hide the cue ball. And, a lot, and they didn't get the concept that you didn't actually have to bank balls into your pocket. You could bank balls into other balls and make them go towards your pocket. And all those little intricacies I show these guys, and a lot of them became very good players, you know, much because they shot so much better than me, then they, you know, they started beating on me and everybody else too. Did you ever play them eight ball, Jay? Uh, not much. They that did. was a game we were – in my house, we played mostly nine ball, one pocket, and I played a bank pool because for what I grew up in an area of Ohio near Kentucky where everybody learned to play bank pool. And back then, the players knew I had my speed at bank pool was about a, a, a speed above my game at one pocket and nine ball. And I was a good bank pool player. I was a very good bank pool player. And I beat a lot of guys like Carlo and Warren and Santos. They could not beat me in bank pool. 
They could not. The only guy that beat me in bank pool was Dennis. And after a while, Dennis started spotting me five to four, which is a big spot in nine ball bank. And he still beat me. I mean, I win, I win a game here or there, but you know, Dennis got to be such a great player for, for several years though. I, I'd say Dennis and Shane were probably the two best players, you know? And I got to be there for that. Uh, the big match they played that went Hill Hill 119 to 120. Yeah. Where Dennis was running around the table the last game. Yeah. Um, you were there? I was there. I was there. Oh, so you've been to the Philippines? No. No, no, no. Well, where that, was that match? That was at Bills here in Oklahoma City. Okay. That's a go. Yep. Okay. Well, no, Dennis, I have to say that. But uh, I won a lot of money betting on Dennis, too, so it's okay. But uh, well, no, Dennis won this. Oh, match. he won. Oh, maybe I won. There was one match that he lost. Oh, he lost to Tony Chohan, and I lost mm -hmm. 5,000. But then the se he said, I'll win it back for you. And then the second time he played Chohan, he beat him. But um, Dennis was probably the best closer of a match that I've ever seen. He, he would win matches from no, he won many matches where he was down till the very end, till the very last day. And he found a way to come. Dennis never gave up. He never gave up. But I have to say, he's not playing as good now. Yeah. Since he can't come to the United States, he doesn't have that. There's a lot of pool, but his game is, he's slipped to okay. speed. Well, do they just call you Uncle Jay in the Philippines or what? Sir Jay. Sir Jay. But you and know, Sean, I did so much commentary of pool over there, not just for Sky Sports, for like World Cup and um, events like that. And they, and they watched Moscone Cup over there. And everything here, like a Derby City, when Filipinos play matches and it's on AccuStats, all those shows get shown in the Philippines. If it's Filipino players, they get shown over and over again. If you ever go over there and you watch late night TV, you will see Philippine pool matches from five and 10 years ago. They show them over and over again. Alex, Efren, Francisco, they show all those matches. They got the whole catalog from AccuStats. All, all matches with Filipino players in them. But uh, um, but you're in every one of them too. You're like the, the, the Joe Rogan of the Philippines. Like you're a part of every match kind of. That's the thing. So, so because of that, because I, I'm, I'm much more well known over there than I am here. If I go to any pool room or any place pool is played, they treat me uh, like a celebrity, and it's really, it's. A, I mean, they're so. Oh, welcome, welcome. If there's a match, listen, I've gone where big matches are going on in the Philippines, money matches, and there's a huge crowd, and I go with my wife to watch. And there's no place to sit. And somebody in the front row will get up and give us a seat and say, oh, you come here, Sir Jay. You come here. This is your seat. And your wife sits here. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff. And you want water? You need a cup of a, a, a bottle of water? Yeah, please. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? Nah, you know, <clears throat> it's like I'm well treated there. And, and that, that's very flattering. You know, it's I have to admit. It's very flattering. Okay. The name to page A. Just give us the That's me. Give us the story. Give us one story. Well, it was an accident. I was prematurely balding. My father was, my brother was. In my early 20s, I was already had a bald spot in back and balding. You know, I was bald. Yeah. And remember, that was the days of hair and uh, um, uh, hippies, and all these guys had long hair. And I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. So when I was like 22, 23 years old, I went to a, a, a shop where they made custom-made toupees and paid like a lot, like $400 or something. And they made me a nice toupee. And uh, I mean, I was already playing a lot of pool. But uh it happened by accident because when I put my toupee on, I also shaved. I used to always have a handlebar mustache. 
when I'm 20, 21, 22. I always had a big mustache like that. I okay. shaved my mustache and put on this toupee and it became a disguise. And it this happened is, by accident. This is what I heard. You'd yeah, go in. You'd go I in. Was, it wasn't my plan, Sean. Uh -huh. but I went into a pool room where I had played some guy. I think it was down in Long Beach where I played some guy like a couple of years before and won like 50 or $60. And I went in there and there's the guy. And so I walk over to him. I said, Hey, you want to, you want to play some nine ball? I think I had played him a five ahead set for 50 once before, which was a very common game hustlers game back then, you know, money game five ahead. So you're playing $10 a game, but somebody's going to win 50 bucks, which in those days that 40 years ago, that was a score. That was money. Anyway, so I go over and ask the guy to play. And he said, sure, what do you want to play? I said, I don't care, 5 or $10 nine ball, five ahead for 50. He says, five ahead for 50, just like we had played two years ago. Now we start playing, and the guy looks at me and says, you know, you look familiar. I've seen you somewhere before. I said, no. He said, you ever been here before? And it's called a place called Broadway Billiards in Long Beach. And I had been there two or three times. I said, no, no, it's my first time. I'm new to, I'm new to Los Angeles. He said, yeah, I've seen you somewhere. I felt like I've seen you somewhere. But I said, yeah, there's a lot of, I told him, I said, there's a lot of guys that look like me. And we went on and played. He, I won. He gave me $50. He, and even at the end, he did not know it was me. And I said, wait a second. I got a fucking disguise. And I did that. I started going back to the same places where I'd played before. Some guys recognized me and some didn't. And some were just uncertain, but I probably played 10 or 12 guys uh, that, that I played again a second time. And even a couple of guys that said, I think, I think we played before somewhere. I said, we might have, I said, I don't remember, but they played me anyway. And finally, but I didn't have a name yet. Nobody named me. Now I go to this place called the Billiard Den in Hollywood. And there's a pool hustler from Arizona, Sean, Sean Walsh. They called him Arizona Slim. He was a good player. He was he was close friends with Don Johnson, the actor. And Don would back him in, in pretty good games. And Sean's in there playing. And I knew Sean. But I hadn't seen Sean in a couple of years. But Sean recognized me when I come in the door. And Sean was this outrageous character. He yells out in the pool room, here comes to J. And I hated it. I was so angry and so mad at him. But everybody heard it, and there were a lot of players in the room. And just like that, by word of mouth, I became Toupee J. It took me about 10, 15 years to come to grips with that name. But now it's okay, you know. Okay. I got one more question I'm going to let Chris ask ask, ask away. Uh, I just forgot. Oh. Oh, can you give us one story from Pool Wars, maybe a short one? I want everybody to buy your book and the, the second one, but can you give us like a it feels like It feels like everybody in the pool world has bought my book. That yeah. book has sold over 10,000 copies, and that's a lot in the pool world because it's never been in bookstores. The only place you can find it is online, but it's sold a lot. It sells to this day. You know what? Most of the sales to this day are today are ebooks, like on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And I, I have a feeling a lot of people that buy the book are not really into pool, but they're into learning about a counterculture. So, okay, what kind of short story could I tell you from that book? It's every, everything. Oh, my. Oh. This one is not really pool specifically about playing, but it's something that happened in pool room when I was 18 years old. Can you move your, can you move your uh, head back or your camera back? There we go. We can see you. This is when I learned my first real lesson in a pool room, what it was like to hang around in the pool world. Okay. I was an 18 year old kid, just start now. And I was hanging in a pool room called Winks Billiards that was behind the shopping center in Dayton. And it was a hangout for, a lot of the best players around Dayton, and they come from all over southwestern Ohio, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Columbus, Cleveland. That's where they come to make games and, and match up. And it was also a hangout 
for gangsters and thieves, for lack of a better word. Outlaws. Yeah, outlaws. That's what they called themselves, outlaws. And they were they were real outlaws. These were not, this was not a joke. These were guys that would rob a bank. By they might break in through the roof, because one guy, the guy that ended up owning Forest Park Billiards, I can say it now. He's dead. Joe Burns. He owned Forest Park Billiards, where they had the Dayton Opens back in the seventies. And Joe Burns was a well-known safe cracker. He knew how to get into safes. But back then, he was a pool hustler. You know, besides cracking safes. But, I mean, these guys were, were, some of them could be very dangerous characters. But I became a regular in the pool room. And after a while, when they would be sitting around a table, to, they were always proud. If somebody got arrested and they made the front page of the paper, they were proud. They say, look, look, I got the front page. They, they had to get bailed out for 10000 or 20000 or something like that. They were proud. And they called themselves thieves. They, you know, if they knew, if they could rob an armored car, an armored car or armored truck, they would do it. They were, you know, these were gangsters that carried guns. Yeah. There was a gang called the Step Gang that was, you ever look at them up online, S-T-E-P-P, -P, notorious gang from southwestern Ohio, all through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Finally, they got dissipated, you know, but some of those guys ended up going to prison for life for murdering people and stuff like that. But they hung out there. And I sometimes would be playing pool on a table right next to where they're all talking. And I would eavesdrop. They did they they carried on their conversation as if I wasn't even there. Because I was a non-entity. I was just a kid hanging around playing pool. But I would hear where they're planning to do things and they're going to meet somebody. We're going to have a meetup out in Springfield. We got, we're going to, we're going to make a score there. They were going to rob somebody or break into a house where there was a lot of money. You know, I, I overheard those conversations, the planning, because they would talk at a table in a normal tone of voice where if you're right nearby, you could hear it. So anyway, one day I hear this conversation between Eddie Henderson who was a big tush hog. We called them tush hogs. I don't know what they called them in Oklahoma. Big guys that were tough guys. Same you know, thing. Uh, Eddie Henderson was planning something, uh, a crime with a couple other guys. And I I thought, oh, that was really cool. I know what's going I know what's going down. So later that night, I'm talking to one of my buddies, and I said, You wouldn't believe what I heard. Eddie Henderson and these two other guys, one was Frank Reeves. And the other guy they called Tiny, they were planning a heist of some kind. It, I think it was a mail heist. You know, they knew where there was um, a mail truck where they carried a lot of a lot of money too. Um, in those days, sometimes businesses made deposits through mail. But anyway, um, so I bragged to him about it. The next day, I come in the pool room. I didn't think Eddie Henderson knew me from Adam, and he probably didn't before. But I'm I'm standing at the counter. I'm getting I want to get a set of balls and go hit balls. And here comes big Eddie Henderson. And he walks over to me. He said, Hey kid. He said, Are you Jay Helfer? I said, Yes, sir. I was afraid. This guy's like 6'3 and 260 pounds. He's a monster. He had hands probably as big as Sonny Liston, huge, huge hands. <coughs> He hauls off and slaps me across the face, but hard, like as hard as you can slap someone. Knocked me right to the ground. I was, you know, my head was spinning. Um, I was hurt. If he'd hit me with his fist like that, he'd have killed me. He would have killed me. He hit me that hard. And he looks down at me and he said, don't ever say anything to anybody about me again. He said, no, don't talk about me. He said, don't ever talk about me again. And man, I never forgot that lesson. Now, the, the weird thing is, it took me a couple minutes to get to my feet. And all I could do is go out to my car and go home. But when I went home and looked in the mirror, there was a red handprint on my face. That's how hard he hit me. And Wow. But he taught me a lesson I never forgot. Keep my mouth shut in the pool room, you know? Mm -hmm. there you go that's a good one Chris 
All yours, man. I'm just going to listen. All right. So back to Ephraim, because, you know, everybody talks about, you know, him being the greatest of all time. Well, we heard a story that um, that Ephraim considered Buddy Hall the greatest shooter of, of all time. Um, to you, who who was the who has been the greatest the greatest shooter? Well, the best pool player I ever saw was Harold Worst, way before your time. He died in 1967. But Harold Worst was a famous three cushion billiard player who won the world championship in 24 down in Argentina, and he beat the Argentine champion before in a stadium with like 10,000 people in it, all really against him. And he had threats on his life. And he won that match anyway. Harold Worst was a, about six feet, probably, but he probably weighed 210 or 20. He was a healthy guy. I remember that. He was a robust guy. But he kind of retired from billiard because when he won that championship, it was like 1958 or 59. And there was not much he could do in billiards. So in the early 60s, he started playing pool. He had already played some pool, but we were starting to have tournaments like the Hustler Tournament at Johnson City. He started playing pool, and within a year or two, he was beating everybody at every game. And he wanted to play Lasseter, and Lasseter didn't want to play him. He wanted to play Ronnie Allen one pocket, and Ronnie ducked him. So he was, the, for many reasons, besides his skill. But he, to this day, I never saw a man that, that had the composure at the table of Aaron Worst. Nothing oh. ever phased him. Um, he made everything he did look easy. And he, he, he was as modest and humble as they come. He never bragged. He never hustled anybody. That wasn't his style. He had a successful business. And he, had, he was making money. But he, he was like Shady. Never turned down a game either. Um, if a hustler like Danny Jones came to him once, and hustled it, hustled him to play like a thousand dollar nine ball. Harold Worth said, just put his cue together. So let's play. And he he busted Danny Jones. And after a while, the hustlers all left him alone and they had respect for him. They had total respect for him. Just like the hustlers to this day respect Shane, because they know Shane will get up and play. You know, I don't know about now, but for a long time, Shane didn't back down from anybody. Yeah. But uh so that was the first guy that was the greatest player. Then Miserak was the dominant player till uh, Earl Strickland came along and, and dethroned Miserak. And Earl Strickland, to this day, he's the best tournament nine ball player I ever saw. He's strong racks. In every match, he'd run six or seven racks. And you just couldn't beat him. Because once he got rolling, you know, he put you in a coma. Nobody ever ran racks like Earl. He, Earl did something I never saw any other pool player do in those days. When he would warm up for match, all he did was practice his break. That's all he did. He practiced his break for 30, 30 minutes or so. So he knew exactly how to break the balls. Because once he knew how to break the balls, you were toast. You were <laughs> toast. <laughs> but then Siegel came along. And Siegel was a winner. Uh, he was a winner. He was a guy, the first guy that came along, that if he played Earl in the finals, Siegel was a favorite. And But Buddy Hall, even though Earl and Siegel were winning more tournaments, Buddy Hall was the best money player. Buddy Hall, for 20 years, nobody wanted to play Buddy Hall nine ball for money until Jose Perica came along. And to this day, the best nine ball and 10 ball player I ever saw was Jose Perica. He beat everybody, and Buddy ducked him. I had got to tell you, Buddy ducked him. Because um, Perica, Perica made a challenge to the world, and everybody wanted Buddy to play him, and as far as I know, they never played. They never played. Wow. But, but what made Efren such a great player is that he played all the other games, too. Efren played top speed nine ball, top speed 10 ball. He was he was the best rotation player. A lot of people don't know that. Siegel tried, tried to play him rotation, and he creamed Siegel. Um, I think Buddy did play him rotation. He beat Buddy at rotation. Siegel, uh, Efren beat everybody he played at rotation. 
He beat him. He beat everybody but Verica and Buddy at nine ball. Now, when it see, yeah, Ephraim knows when Ephraim, everybody knows when Ephraim first came, he was winning. He won the big Reds tournament and he was beating everybody at nine ball for a year or so. But then the players figured out what Ephraim was doing. He kicked the balls. This was before the jump shot. And he kicked balls so much better than anybody else. He kicked offensively to hide balls or hide the cue ball. And nobody ever did that before. They were just kicking to hit the ball. But once guys like Buddy and Ephraim, I mean, excuse me, Buddy and, and Siegel caught on to how to play him, they started beating Ephraim in tournaments. And Ephraim, Ephraim could, he had trouble with Buddy and he had trouble with Siegel in the tournaments. As I think he, he kind of was 50-50 with, with Earl. But uh, um, Efren didn't win a nine ball tournament for a good five or six years till the early 90s. What Efren had to do was improve his break. His break was his weak point. And once he finally learned how to break, then he started winning tournaments again in the 90s. But Efren was top nine ball. Uh, only guy that could beat him in, in 10 ball would have been Buddy and, and, uh, um, and Parika. Um, but one pocket, he was... Far and away, he spotted the world. Efren spotted – nobody could play Efren even in one pocket once he learned how to play. In bank pool, he played really good. You know, he was right there with the top players. So Efren was – it's hard to say who the greatest player was. I could probably pick five, but Buddy would be there among the five because Buddy was the dominant money player for a good 20 years. And the only guy I think that could ever beat him was probably Parika. And who knows, they never played. But I know that Parika offered to play him a couple of times. And, buddy, they were in the same room, in the same place. And Buddy, buddy didn't want to bother with him. I think Buddy knew it would be, it'd be a tough match. And were you, uh, were you in Oklahoma when Buddy lived here? Pardon me? Were you in Oklahoma when Buddy lived here? Uh, once or twice. Uh, I think I was only in True Loves one time. And I know... He was in his prime there. His prime years were in Shreveport first. I forget the pool room downstairs, but then in True Love second. He was in True Love's probably through the 90s. Yeah. Into, into the probably the 2000s. But I, I listen, number one, I'm surprised he's still alive because he's so heavy. He was, Buddy was probably pushing 500 pounds for a long time. He must have a really, really strong heart. Um, yeah. He was the same size as Miserec. And they were, they're both grossly obese. And what made me saddest about Buddy is I used to practice one. Buddy played all, listen, something that made Buddy such a great player, even more so than Efren. And if I had to rank them on, on, on all around ability, I would take Buddy over Efren. If you're going by all-around ability, because Buddy had no weaknesses. Nine ball, ten ball, one pocket, bank pool. He, ex I guess his, if he had a weakness, it was straight pool. I know he could play, but he didn't like to play. And Efren probably has the edge over Buddy in straight pool. But listen, very few – you very, saw very few money games in straight pool, ever, ever. But uh, Buddy – when I used to practice with Buddy back in the – 70s and 80s, he would give me eight to four, and we play for 10 a game just for practice, and I could never beat him. And then I see Buddy down in Tunica like seven or eight years ago, and I wasn't really even playing that good. And here comes big fat Buddy in there, and he says, Jay, you want to practice a little one pocket? He said, I'll play you even now. We'll play the same $10 a game. I'll play you even. I, I beat Buddy out of five games for $10 a game, playing even. that His game was so weak, it was embarrassing. I didn't even ask him to pay me. In fact, I think later on I gave him $50. I, I just so, felt so bad for him because he couldn't play. He couldn't play, you know. So that was, that was depressing to see how far he had fallen. But he'd been carrying all that weight for a good 15 years. Yeah. Uh, we're right at an hour, Chris. Um, I want to do another one with Jay Helfert in, the, in a month, a few weeks, whatever, um, when we've got 
some of our audience's questions that they have for you. That's fine with me. Some things that, I, that come from this interview, I like to rewatch them and dive deeper into, into some things you said. I could probably tell you a lot more about a lot of things, but, uh, you know, it's, it's probably best if you ask me a question, I can kind of delve into my memory. But you see, it was hard for me to pick a story from Pool Wars because there's like 40 stories in there, but a lot of them are longer. And the, the slap in the face was pretty quick. All right, so <laughs> That's I'm probably gonna, about a three-page story. I want to ask you one more that Robert LeBlanc told me to ask you. Oh, yeah. Something about him walking into a pool hall when y'all first met and him hustling you or some something like that. Uh I think it was a bar where I first met him. And I think he was playing, playing somebody like $10 eight ball. And I asked him to play. And he says, uh, uh, I think we played 10 ahead for a hundred dollars. And he ran like, it was one to one. And then he ran like, no, he ran the last nine reps. I remember that he was one up. We had gone back and forth a few games, and he ran nine racks on me. I remember him wow. springing a whole bunch of racks on me, and I said, I'm done with you. And yeah. I don't think I ever played with him on a bar table again. We did play bank pool after that, but never, we never played on a bar table, and so we never played the tournament. Game. But I did. we did gamble together a few times. We went partners once. Uh, we played partners bank pool against Max Everly and the guy they fall, call Fat Boy who's got big money. And we played like $20 a man bank pool. This is recent. This is like in the last 10 years. And Fat Boy played pretty good bank pool. And Max Everly is, you know, he's a top pro player. We crushed them. We crushed them. But we beat them like six games in a row before they finally gave up. Wow. So, so Robert listen, was that good, huh? Listen, Robert LeBlanc, even more than me, because once I got to California, I stayed pretty much on the West Coast. Robert LeBlanc crisscrossed his country. He was a true roadman for probably a good 20, 25 years. He went everywhere. There were places I missed and he went to. I went to, I went to all the places in the cities where I knew there was action. But he went to all the little towns. And Bobby played everywhere. And he played, he played the best players. And he... Listen, on a bar table, he was a top player. He was a top player. On a big table, he was still a good player. It took a strong player to beat him. He was he was a speed above me. The only game I know I, I could probably beat Bobby out would have been bank. Everything else I know he's – even one pocket, he's a favorite over me. It's close at me and him in one pocket, but uh, um, Bobby yeah. mostly played nine ball and eight ball on a bar table, but he's the, he's the real deal, believe me. I so know that. What should we ask him about, Jay? Since huh? he put the question in, what should you we know, ask him about? You know, we nobody ever called him Bobby LeBlanc. His nickname, he was known by all over the United States, was Cotton, because yeah. he had white hair from the time he was in his twenties. I'll tell you what I want to ask him. I never asked him. How did you get white hair so young? <laughs> he had white hair when he was in his twenties. I mean, all white, and that's how he got the nickname Cotton. Okay. Everybody knew Cotton. I don't. I don't. I don't remember seeing that part in his book. Oh. Ask him. I will. I, what caused him to have white hair? Is it genetics? I. You know, a lot of things you just don't ask guys. But I never did ask him that question. It it, it, it might go over easier. We say, hey, Jay Hilbert wanted us to ask you. <laughs> you got white hair? That's so okay. I don't care. I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you can say. You can say to him. I heard, Jay Helfer told us that you were known all over the country, not by nobody knew who Bobby LeBlanc was, but they knew Cotton. They said, yeah. they say, "Ask him where did you get the nickname Cotton." He'll tell you. Okay. He'll okay. tell you. That's and then name. you have a lead in to say, "Well, when did your hair start getting white?" <laughs> I will. I will. I will. Well, Jay, we appreciate your time. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, I do have, I mean, I do have plenty more questions. That's um, okay. We have a... Uh, I feel like I didn't give you all the best answers, but I did the best I could. Uh, we, we we enjoyed it. Um, we have... Play big, for next time. Yeah. We have a well, big... You know, I'm a pool freak like you guys. I, 
I got pool captured me when I was 18, and it really hasn't let go yet. And what I like to say is once a pool player, always a pool player. Even if people quit, they always come back. Sure enough. Indeed. Sure enough. I've walked away from plenty of jobs because I made more money playing pool than I did working it. You know, I'll say tell you one last thing, Chris, since you mentioned it. I was working as an accountant in Los Angeles when I'm 24 years old for $125 a week and playing pool, mostly playing pool at night, once in a while going and playing poker. But, uh, you know, I'd win $20, 30 $40 because that was what, in the bars, That's they're playing a dollar, $2 a game. So if you won $20, you did all right. Anyway, but back in those days, in the 1960s, that was money. So, but one weekend on a Friday night, uh, somebody steered me to a place called the Santa Ana Playhouse in Santa Ana, California. And I walk in there and there's six bar tables and there's quarters lined up on all of them. Everyone's got like a dozen quarters. So I just picked a table, put a quarter up and I got to wait like an hour for my turn. But when I got, and they're playing eight ball, every game is for money, anywhere from one to $5. A big game was $5, a small game was a dollar. You had to play for something. And I, I liked it. That's what I wanted. And I waited till I got, I just made my mind up. I'm not going to try to stall or anything. I'm going to try to keep that table. Because if I, if I lost, I wasn't going to go back to the end of the line. I was going to go home. I held that table from like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night till the bar closed to 2 o'clock in the morning. And I probably won 40 or 50 games. And I remember I walked out of there with like 120. All these $1 bills and and a few fives all wrapped up in my pockets. And when I got home, I had won in that night as much as I had to work a week for, you know, at my job. You know, a 40-hour work week, I'd won it in four hours. And that and was the end of your accounting career. Listen, the beginning of the end. I went to work on Monday and I gave him two-week notice. <laughs> <laughs> I never had another job. I swear. That was my last job in my life. <laughs> so they say money won is quite is twice as sweet as money earned. Yeah. Well, it, I was doing something I enjoyed, and it didn't take me a long time, you know. Yeah. And I realized then that I could do better going out to the bars every night, and I did. In those days, we play in the pool rooms in the daytime, and you know, in the afternoons and the evenings, and at night we go to the bars. That was my routine. And a lot of guys did the same thing. Peace. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, guys, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we like I said, appreciate having Jay this evening. Um, and we'll catch you all next time on the Pulling Around Show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.